All right, this is part two of the second reading. Here we go. Spin. The war wasn't all terror and violence. Sometimes things could get almost sweet. For instance, I remember a little boy with a plastic leg. I remember how he hopped over to a czar and asked for a chocolate bar. G.I. number one, the kid said, and Azar laughed and handed over the chocolate. When the boy hopped away, Azar clucked his tongue and said, War's a bitch. He shook his head sadly. One leg, for Christ's sake. Some poor fucker ran out of ammo. All right, so for question number five, the correct answer is C. Azar's cruelty in the last line is juxtaposed with the sweetness of the first parts of the passage. So this is a strong example of juxtaposition. We have very different emotional states from one part of the passage to the end. The answer is not A, uh, though that is the second best answer because war's a bitch is a metaphor, but the juxtaposition is a stronger example in this passage. There is no evidence for B, there is no evidence for D, and uh, it is not E because C is a correct answer. I remember Mitchell Sanders sitting quietly in the shade of an old banyan tree. He was using a thumbnail to pry off the body lice, working slowly, carefully depositing the lice in a blue USO envelope. His eyes were tired. It had been a long two weeks in the bush. After an hour or so, he sealed up the envelope, wrote free in the upper right-hand corner, and addressed it to his draft board in Ohio. On occasions, the war was like a ping-pong ball. You could put fancy spin on it. You could make it dance. I remember Norman Bowker and Henry Dobbins playing checkers every evening before dark. It was a ritual for them. They would dig a foxhole and get the board out and play long, silent games as the sky went from pink to purple. The rest of us would sometimes stop by to watch. There was something restful about it, something orderly and reassuring. There were red checkers and black checkers. The playing field was laid out in a strict grid. No tunnels or mountains or jungles. You knew where you stood. You knew the score. The pieces were out on the board. The enemy was visible. You could watch the tactics unfolding into larger strategies. There was a winner and a loser. There were rules. All right, so for this question, question six, the correct answer is B. The checkers game is being presented as a metaphor for war. Uh, there is no evidence of A, C, or D, and it is not E because B is the correct answer. I'm 43 years old and a writer now, and the war has been over for a long while. Much of it is hard to remember. I sit at this typewriter and stare through my words and watch Kiowa sinking into the deep muck of a shit field or Kurt Lemon hanging in pieces from a tree. And as I write about these things, the remembering is turned into a kind of rehappening. Kiowa yells at me. Kurt Lemon steps from the shade into bright sunlight, his face brown and shining, and then he soars into a tree. The bad stuff never stops happening. It lives in its own dimension, replaying itself over and over. But the war wasn't all that way. Like when Ted Lavender went too heavy on the tranquilizers. How's the war today, someone would say. And Ted Lavender would give a soft, spacey smile and say, Mellow, man. We got ourselves a nice, mellow war today. And like the time we enlisted an old papasan to guide us through the minefields out on the Batangan Peninsula. The old guy walked with a limp, slow and stooped over. But he knew where the safe spots were and where you had to be careful and where even if you were careful, you could end up like popcorn. He had a tightrope walker's feel for the land beneath him, its surface tension, the give and take of things. Each morning we'd form up in a long column, the old papasan out front, and for the whole day we'd troop along after him, tracing his footsteps, playing an exact and ruthless game of follow the leader. Rat Kiley made up a rhyme that caught on, and we'd all be chanting it together. Step out of line, hit a mine, follow the dink, you're in the pink. 
All around us the place was littered with bouncing Bettys and toe poppers and booby-trapped artillery rounds. But in those five days on the Batangang Peninsula, nobody got hurt. We all learned to love the old man. It was a sad scene when the choppers came to take us away. Jimmy Cross gave the old Papasan a hug. Mitchell Sanders and Lee Strunk loaded him up with boxes of sea rations. There were actually tears in the old guy's eyes. Follow Dink, he said to each of us. You go pink. All right, so for question number seven, uh, the, answer, the correct answer is B, because there is evidence of that in the passage. There is no evidence of A. There's only one example of C, them working with the local. And there's no evidence of D or for E. This is the last one that I'm going to explain the incorrect answers on. I'm going to just give the explanation for the correct answer for here on in. If you weren't humping, you were waiting. I remember the monotony. Digging foxholes, slapping mosquitoes, the sun and the heat and the endless patties. Even in the deep bush where you could die any number of ways, the war was nakedly and aggressively boring. But it was a strange boredom. It was a boredom with a twist, a kind of boredom that caused stomach disorders. You'd be sitting at the top of a high hill, the flat patties stretching out below, and the day would be calm and hot and utterly vacant, and you'd feel the boredom dripping inside you like a leaky faucet. Except it wasn't water. It was a sort of acid. And with each little droplet, you'd feel the stuff eating away at important organs. You'd try to relax. You'd uncurl your fists and let your thoughts go. Well, you'd think, this isn't so bad. And right then you'd hear gunfire behind you, and your nuts would fly up into your throat, and you'd be squealing pig squeals. That kind of boredom. All right, so question eight, the correct answer is C. It is juxtaposition because of the difference between the monotony at the beginning of the passage and the terror at the end of the passage. I feel guilty sometimes, 43 years old, and I'm still writing war stories. My daughter Kathleen tells me it's an obsession, that I should write about a little girl who finds a million dollars and spends it all on a Shetland pony. In a way, I guess she's right. I should forget it. But the thing about remembering is that you don't forget. You take your material where you find it, which is in your life, at the intersection of past and present. The memory traffic feeds into a rotary up on your head, where it goes in circles for a while. Then pretty soon imagination flows in, and the traffic merges and shoots off down a thousand different streets. As a writer, all you can do is pick a street and go for a ride, putting things down as they come at you. That's the real obsession. All those stories. Not bloody stories, necessarily. Happy stories, too. And even a few peace stories. Here's a quick peace story. A guy goes AWOL, shacks up in Da Nang with a Red Cross nurse. It's a great time. The nurse loves him to death. The guy gets whatever he wants whenever he wants it. The war's over, he thinks, just nooky and new angles. But then one day he rejoins his unit in the bush. Can't wait to get back into action. Finally, one of his buddies asks what happened with the nurse. Why so hot for combat? And the guy says, all that peace, man, it felt so good it hurt. I want to hurt it back. I remember Mitchell Sanders smiling as he told me that story. Most of it he made up, I'm sure, but even so, it gave me a quick truth goose. Because it's all relative. You're pinned down in some filthy hellhole of a patty getting your ass delivered to kingdom come. But then, for a few seconds, everything goes quiet. And you look up and you see the sun and a few puffy white clouds. And the immense serenity flashes against your eyeballs. The whole world gets rearranged. And even though you're pinned down by a war, you never felt more at peace. What sticks to memory often are those odd little fragments that have no beginning and no end. Norman Bowker, lying on his back one night, watching the stars, then whispering to me, I'll tell you something, O'Brien. If I could have one wish, anything, I'd wish for my dad to write me a letter and say it's okay if I don't win any medals. That's all my old man talks about, nothing else. How he can't wait to see my goddamn medals.
or Kiowa teaching a rain dance to Rat Kiley and Dave Jensen, the three of them whooping and leaping around barefoot while a bunch of villagers looked on with a mixture of fascination and giggly horror. Afterward, Rat said, So where's the rain? And Kiowa said, The earth is slow, but the buffalo is patient. And Rat thought about it and said, Yeah, but where's the rain? Or Ted Lavender adopting an orphan puppy, feeding it from a plastic spoon and carrying it in his rucksack, until the day Azar strapped the puppy to a Claymore anti-personnel mine and squeezed the firing device. So for question number nine, uh, B is the best answer, although A is definitely the second best answer. The average age in our platoon, I guess, was 19 or 20, and as a consequence... Things often took on a curiously playful atmosphere, like a sporting event at some exotic reform school. The competition could be lethal, yet there was a childlike exuberance to it all. Lots of pranks and horseplay, like when Azar blew away Ted Lavender's puppy. What's everybody so upset about? Azar said. I mean, Christ, I'm just a boy. I remember these things, too. The damp, fungal scent of an empty body bag. A quarter moon rising over the nighttime patties. Henry Dobbins sitting in the twilight, sewing on his new Buck Sergeant stripes, quietly singing, A tisket, a tasket, a green and yellow basket. A field of elephant grass, weighted with wind, bowing under the stir of a helicopter's blades. The grass dark and servile, bending low but then rising straight again when the chopper went away. A red clay trail outside the village of Mike, a hand grenade, a slim, dead, dainty young man of about twenty. Kiowa saying, No choice, Tim. What else could you do? Kiowa saying, Right? Kiowa saying, Talk to me. Forty-three years old, and the war occurred half a lifetime ago. And yet the remembering makes it now. And sometimes remembering will lead to a story, which makes it forever. That's what stories are for. Stories are for joining the past to the future. Stories are for those late hours in the night when you can't remember how you got from where you were to where you are. Stories are for eternity, when memory is erased, when there is nothing to remember except the story. All right, so for question number 10, the correct answer is B, that is parallel structure, because of the repeated language of Kiowa saying, Kiowa saying, and Kiowa saying. I'm going to stop this recording now, and we'll do one last recording for this reading for the On the Rainy River section. <laughs> 